Imagine being strapped in to a tight driver's seat. Shiny hard plastic and metal locks you in, with no room to move. A helmet squeezes onto your head, and gloves onto your hands. In front, a fan gulps air like a thirsty dog. Lights and numbers blink onto the steering wheel as loud engines roar awake all around you. Ten seconds. All you hear is the thunder rumbling from the twenty car's hoods. You grab the gear pedal. This is it. Your heartbeat is way louder than the screaming V6 engine behind you. The green light flashes. Floor the gas pedal. Over 900 horses shove you backwards, hard. Everything outside is just streaky smears. Four and a half Gs smash you tight at over 160 miles per hour. Strong winds yank at your helmet, but can't rip it off. Your sweaty hands crank the wheel around a tight turn tires squealing. Everything seems squeezed small, with G's tearing at your body. The cement wall zips by your elbow. You zoom out and glue your eyes to the back of the race car in front, waiting for an opening. Like a high-stakes game of high-speed tag at 220 miles per hour, cat and mouse. This is Formula One racing. At these speeds, every split second counts. And one wrong reaction can mean disaster and even death. Join us in this adrenaline-pumping coverage of the top six worst fatalities in this extreme sport. Formula One racing, also known as F1, is the highest class of international racing for open-wheel, single-seater Formula racing cars. It's called Formula One because it adheres to a strict set of rules or formula that specify limitations on technology and designs for the race cars. This formula has been defined and refined over F1's 70-plus year history to allow for blistering speeds while ensuring close competition. It's a high-tech, high-stakes chess match on wheels. Leaders swap repeatedly in the game of pit strategy and fuel conservation. Telemetry data pours into the pits to be analyzed for the slightest adjustments. Driver concentration must be flawless as the cars dance on the razor's edge of control. In a sport where millionths of a second separate podium spots, the risks are great, but the glory is higher for those who can master both car and course. Formula One uniquely mixes danger, cutting-edge technology, strategy, and split-second decision-making into the highest level race on the planet. When you place 20 courageous drivers on racetracks built for high speeds and tight cornering, you're bound to be left with some fatalities. Since its inception, about 52 drivers have died on the hot tar of the circuit, and this number doesn't include marshals and spectators. Strap in for a wild ride as we take a look at some of the worst F1 fatalities in the history of this extreme motorsport. While the crashes you are about to witness are some of the most brutal in history, there are some accidents that changed the course of safety in F1. The first Formula One World Championship Grand Prix took place on May 13, 1950, at the Silverstone Circuit in England. There was no doubt that this was a dangerous new sport. In 1952, the year helmets became mandatory, the world saw its first F1 fatality with Cameron Earl in a test crash. This was the start of a long string of deaths that only started to dwindle in the 80s and 90s. After two devastating and unnecessary deaths in 1994, Formula One authorities decided to implement standardized safety procedures. This came in the form of improved helmet designs, stronger barriers, new tires, and higher cockpit sidewalls for better driver protection. While these crashes certainly changed the course of F1 safety as we know it, they pale in comparison to the brutality of what you were about to witness. Accidents happen, but what's worse is when those in charge ignore the red flags that could have prevented tragedy. This is what happened in the case of Joseph Schlesser, a talented race car driver who was part of Honda's team. Before his F1 career was cut short, the French-born racer took part in Le Mans and Formula 2, where he gained most of his fame. In 1968, an opportunity came for Joe to be in the cockpit of a Formula One car during the French Grand Prix. It was the latest Honda RA302, complete with an experimental air-cooled engine and magnesium chassis. 
the experimental F1 car was tested out by none other than racing legend John Surtees. He told the Honda team that the car was not ready for racing and called it a potential death trap. Regardless, Honda wanted to show off its latest innovation. So, when the time came to race, John refused to step foot in the vehicle. Being the local hero, Honda hired Joseph Schlesser to step up to the challenge instead. In the second lap out of 60, John Surtees' stark warning became a painful reality. On the Six Frères corner, without any warning, the Honda RA302 slid out, spun wildly, and came crashing into the side barrier. 58 laps worth of fuel, as well as the highly flammable magnesium chassis, caught fire, trapping Joe in the vehicle and preventing marshals from getting close enough to pull him out. By the time the flames were quelled and Joe was dragged out of the burning wreckage, it was too late for anything to be done. The most painful truth about this accident is that it was caused by senseless corporate greed and a desire to show off a car that was ultimately a death trap. If the team leaders of Honda had listened to warnings about the car, it's possible Joe would still be with us today. Next up, we have Jochen Rent from Germany. He's the only driver to ever be awarded with a world championship win after his death. Jochen began racing motorcycles, but quickly transitioned to cars in the early 1960s. He competed in Formula Junior and Formula 2, before moving to the big boy sport of Formula 1. He made his F1 debut in 1964 as part of the Rob Walker Racing Team, but it wasn't until a year later that his name started to spread around the conversations of F1 fanatics. In 1965, he joined the Cooper team and scored his first podium finish in the second race of the season. This propelled Rent into a prosperous F1 career, racing for teams like Lotus and Brabham. He became a legend on the racetrack for his aggressive driving style and fearless approach to racing. Outside of the circuit, everyone knew him for his charismatic personality and diehard spirit. It's unfortunate that his most successful racing season was marred by his devastating death. It was 1970, and Rint was at the top of his game. Even with fierce competition from wildly talented rivals, Rint still managed to win the first five out of nine races in the season putting him on course for the championship win. Burning to death is the last way any F1 driver wants to go, and at this time in the sport, it was all too common, as we just saw with Joseph Schlesser's tragic story. The standard safety belts used a five-point harness. Wanting to escape a burning wreckage in time, Jochen decided it would be better not to fasten the fifth point of the harness in between his legs. Little did he know, trying to avoid a horrible death would lead to another. It was September 5th in Monza, Italy. Jochen Rint, as well as many other drivers, were practicing for the final four rounds of the Italian Grand Prix. As Jochen approached the iconic Curva Parabolica, he braked at high speed, but a failure of the brake shaft caused him to lose control of the vehicle. The car slammed into a poorly installed guardrail, causing the car to spin. Because Jochen was not strapped in properly, he slid out of the bottom of his five-point harness, fatally cutting his throat on the seat belt. Nothing could be done to save the 28-year-old as his life force slowly ebbed away. Jochen might have missed the last four races after his fatal crash, but his commanding lead in the point standings meant he still snatched up the victory and was awarded the world championship after his death. At least his death did not go in vain. Stricter seatbelt regulations were formed, and the need for well-installed barriers became more apparent. The death that Jochen Rint was trying so desperately to avoid was exactly what Roger Williamson faced just a few years later in 1973. He was extremely passionate about racing, well-respected by many motorsport racers, and he was a two-time British Formula 3 champion. With his speed and skill on the track, there was no doubt that Williamson could be a world champion. But this hope was cut short in his second Formula 1 race at the Dutch Grand Prix. It was only two weeks after a botched performance. After a poor start, Williamson managed to climb to 13th place with ferocious determination. As he was coming around a corner on his eighth lap, a catastrophic failure occurred. His front left tire exploded, sending the March 731 into a metal barrier. The car launched into the air and landed 230 feet away from the point of impact, spewing fuel and sparks as it slid on its roof. Williamson had not been severely injured in the crash, but he was now trapped inside a car that was being engulfed in flames. 
The only person to come to his rescue was David Purley, Williamson's close friend and an ex-paratrooper. Two marshals stood and watched as Purley tried to overturn the car to save his friend's life. He even emptied a fire extinguisher on the wreckage, but it was not enough to stop the flames. Purley later admitted he could hear his friend yelling as the fire raged on. An investigation found that the barrier had been incorrectly installed on sand instead of concrete, which launched the car instead of stopping it. After this incident, it became mandatory for track marshals to wear fire retardant clothing, and the quality of their training improved. You may wonder why no other racers stopped to help. To sum it up, after the race, when Niki Lauda was asked why he didn't stop to help Roger Williamson, he simply said, I am paid to race, not to stop. It's clear this was a catastrophe that could have been avoided by proper planning and a little bit of human empathy. Another senseless accident that could have been avoided is that of Helmuth Koenig, a 25-year-old Austrian driver. Viewers beware. This next crash is likely the most extreme on the list. Helmuth started his racing career like many F1 drivers before him in a Mini Cooper. He had purchased this from the great Niki Lauda in the hopes of becoming the next Formula One champion to come out of Vienna. Before he made the jump to F1, Helmuth competed in touring car races, Formula V, and Formula Ford. After establishing a name for himself in motor car racing, he was eventually able to buy a seat with Scuderia Finotto, racing in the Austrian Grand Prix in 1974. He didn't qualify. But he won an opportunity to be a part of the Surtees racing team, created by John Surtees. After Helmuth proved his salt in the 1974 Canadian Grand Prix, he was beginning to establish a name for himself as the challenger to look out for in 1975. Unfortunately, he would not live long enough to see his victories come to life. On the 6th of October 1974, during the U.S. Grand Prix on Watkins Glen Racetrack, Helmuth Koenig suffered a catastrophic suspension failure on turn number seven. A suspension failure can cause a complete loss of control of the vehicle. So, unable to turn, Helmuth traveled head-on into the guardrail that was supposed to prevent serious injury. The fatal flaw was an incorrectly fastened guardrail. The bottom section buckled under the force of the car, while the top section remained intact. Helmuth went right through this gap, and the speed, force, and angle impacted his upper torso, tragically removing his head from his body. What would have normally been a low-speed crash with minor injuries turned into a freak accident that traumatized everyone there that day. Helmuth Koenig's death was easily avoidable had the guardrail been properly installed. However, nothing would prepare the F1 world for the catastrophic incident that claimed the lives of not one, but two people at the Kialami racetrack during the South African Grand Prix. One of these men was the up-and-coming Tom Price, a Welsh racing driver who took Formula One by storm. Price got his start racing for the small team known as Token Racing, making the only start for them in the 1974 Belgian Grand Prix. He then joined the Shadow Team and started to taste the sweet nectar of fame and success. He earned his first podium finish in Austria in 1975, and his second came in Brazil a year later. Everyone started to hear about the young Welshman, known for his daring speeds on the track and his genuine down-to-earth personality off of it. Price's team considered him to be one of the best wet-weather drivers around, keeping control of the car when others would seemingly spin out. Ironic, considering his fatal incident occurred in wet conditions. During a practice session for the 1977 South African Grand Prix, Tom was demolishing the competition. This was no small feat since the competition included the likes of Nicky Lauda and James Hunt. However, by the 22nd lap, Tom had fallen behind and was pushing his car to the limit to try and catch up. It was then that tragedy struck. Tom Price's teammate, Renzo Zorzi, experienced a fuel metering unit problem that prompted him to pull over to the left side of the main straight for help. A teenage marshal by the name of Frederick Janssen van Vuren ran across the road to extinguish the fire that started to blaze on Zorzi's engine. But in that split second, Price came around a corner, traveling at an estimated 170 miles per hour. He struck the teenage marshal in the foot, causing him to flip through the air and land on the other side of the road. 
In a tragic and freak twist of fate, the fire extinguisher the marshal was carrying struck Tom Price in the helmet, the force of which killed him instantly. What makes this crash even more saddening is the fact that 27-year-old Tom Price had such a bright future ahead of him. With his ongoing success, Price was identified as a potential future race winner and world champion. He was the only Welshman to win a Formula One race. Fortunately, the safety of Formula One has improved immensely since its inception. There have only been five fatalities since 1994, which is why the 2015 death of Jules Bianchi came as such a shock to the community. It had been 20 peaceful years in the sport of F1 with no fatalities. Jules was the grandson of Mauro Bianchi, a former racer who competed in three non-championship Formula One Grand Prix in 1961. It's clear that racing ran in his blood, as he wanted to follow in his grandfather's tire tracks. While he didn't win any races, Jules had a passion for the sport as much as any championship winner. In 2012, he broke into the Formula One world as a practice driver for Sahara Force India, and in the following year, he made his debut racing for Marussia. In this time, the best result was 13th place in the Malaysian Grand Prix. As a youngster on the scene, there was hope that he would have a prosperous future in the sport. This all came to a sudden end on October 5, 2014. It was the 43rd lap in the Japanese Grand Prix. Heavy rainfall showered on the Suzuka circuit due to Typhoon Fanfon. Adrian Sutil from Team Sauber had already slid out from the wet conditions, crashing into a side barrier. As a recovery vehicle was tending to Adrian's vehicle, Jules came around the particularly tricky corner at a high speed, failing to slow down enough for the slippery track. He spun out and slammed into the recovery vehicle with such force that it lifted the heavy machinery. Jules suffered what is called a diffuse axonal injury, which is extreme trauma to the brain. The race was immediately stopped, with Lewis Hamilton being declared the winner. 25-year-old Jules' tragic story didn't end here. He was kept in an artificial coma for an entire month. Over 90% of people who suffer from a diffuse axonal injury never regain consciousness, and over time, the efforts of the doctors and neurosurgeons were in vain. The impact and trauma from his collision with the recovery vehicle proved too extreme. Nine months after his crash in Japan, Jules Bianchi passed away from his head injuries. Tributes poured in, with the Marussia team describing Bianchi as a magnificent human being and a shining talent. Lewis Hamilton dedicated his win to Jules. Thanks for watching today's story. Tell me what you think in the comments, and I'll see you in the next one.